there are many things to be said about the E-Ray IX, but I think uh, of the key things we like to tell people, it's risk-based. So they've taken it, they're classifying AI systems into four risk levels, unacceptable, high, minimal, limited, and it's also to protect users. So they, they basically conceptualize AI systems as products and then uh, input or enforce product safety rules on AI systems. Our guest for today's podcast, uh, Michael Borelli, he's the director of AI and Partners. He has more than a decade of experience in tech companies and regulation issues, and he's a regulatory specialist for AI in particular. He's also especially familiar with key recent developments, including the recent EU AI Act, which has just come, which has just come into effect. His company, AI and Partners, facilitates the safe deployment of trustworthy AI and works on their company motto, AI that you can trust. No, Michael, I'm so happy to, to be able to have this podcast here with you today. Um, how, how are you doing, first of hey, all? Hey, Benson, first and foremost, thank you so much for having us on. Great to see you again after seeing you in uh, Geneva. Very well. Um, lots of things happening, and I think it's going to be an exciting few months ahead. Nice. So, Michael, for those of our viewers out there who you know may not have been following the nitty-gritty details of the passage of the EU AI Act into the law, what can you tell us about this world's first pioneering piece of AI governance. There are many things to be said about the E-Ray AI Act, but I think uh, of the key things we like to tell people, it's risk-based. So they've taken it, they're classifying AI systems into four risk levels, unacceptable, high, minimal, limited, and it's also to protect users. So they, they basically conceptualize AI systems as products and then uh, input or enforce product safety rules on AI systems. So they have to go through pre, pre and post market checks so to make sure that anyone using or interacting with an AI system um, ensures that it's safe, secure, and trustworthy. And it's the world's first effort. So like GDPR, it's uh, the Brussels effect, which means that um, an e-regulation has global impact uh, beyond its beyond its borders. Um, it is scheduled to come into effect. So it's pretty exciting. Nice. That, that is exciting. Now, maybe just one question about you know this classification system. So I'm, I'm sure you know that in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of extra attention that's been placed on foundation models and other general purpose AI models. You know, some policymakers and experts out there feel that there's a need to treat these models differently because of maybe their scale and their versatility. So when it comes to the EU AI Act and how it classifies risks, what kind of approach did the, did, did the EU take for this? Well, it, the way we like to explain it to our clients and partners is it's like KYC in financial crime. So. KYC, you have to identify your client because the risk level determines how you deal with it um, or the person. And the same thing, the same concept applies to AI systems. How you deal with it depends on its risk level. Risk in this context refers to the risk to an individual's health, safety, and fundamental rights. So the EU Act is very much linked to the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, uh, the principles of the digital decade, and the um, ethical ethics principles of the high-level expert group uh, formed by the EU. So it's all grounded in almost consumer protection uh, with la other layers added on like like data protection, like antitrust, competition, mm -hmm. this type of thing. So it's very it's protecting the user and their health, safety and fundamental rights from AI systems. I see, I see. So um, would that mean that in terms of like this general purpose models, uh, the focus should still be on just the, the risk-based output is, is that what it's, uh... it's yes output but also the input and the processing so if you think of the way that um how a process works or you know you have an input you have a process and output that the way that an ai system works is no different the input would be data the process would be the training of the model um and all the processes that occur through there and the output would be how it interacts with the external environment so Yes, the, the output is very much crucial, but the inputs and the processes are um, they're not mutually exclusive in that sense. Um, and I think the OECD I conceptualizes see. quite nicely in the in their in their graphic of how an AI system looks and how it interacts with the external uh, environment. I see. I see. That's really interesting. Now, I'm definitely not an expert on what's what's happening in the EU, but uh, I did read online that you know in the maybe the later stages of the development of the EU AI Act. There had been some extra discussion between some of the key EU members like Germany and France about, you know, the treatment of these, uh, you know, foundation models and general purpose models. 
uh, would you be able to sh would you be able to share a little bit more about maybe what happened there and how things got resolved? Unfortunately, I wasn't in Brussels, so I wouldn't be able to give you boots on the ground. But uh, we've been tracking this since its initial proposal and on the um, on the twenty first of April, twenty twenty one. What's happened is it initially started off with it being a product safety regulation. So it was mainly focusing on AI systems that were, for example, monitoring national critical infrastructure or embedded, uh, embedded in products. Now what's happened, as you probably know, on the 30th of November 2022, the launch of ChatGPT and the, almost the Cambrian explosion meant that, um, and the significant uptake in ChatGPT meant that it poses systemic risk. So they had to slightly alter the provisions and bring general purpose AI systems or gen AI or whatever vernacular you want to use with it within scope. So it slightly changed it. That being said, uh, the, the momentous and heroic efforts of the teams in Brussels to put this together managed to bring it within scope without significantly diluting or substan substantially altering the text uh, to, bring, to bring them within scope. So now we have a very fully fledged comprehensive and robust piece of legislation. So, um, and it's it's due to the wonderful work by the AI office, the co rapporteurs and everyone else involved. Nice, that is really interesting. And yeah, speaking of you know this really fully fleshed out piece of legislation, I I, I did read that um, that is not just about that the the, the that the legislation doesn't just include provisions about regulatory obligations. There's some provisions on sandboxes as well. Would you be able to share more about that initiative and what are these? Sandbox is supposed to do, how are these supposed to help? So Sandbox is, the concept of Sandbox was coined, in, for example, during the FinTech, um, in the FinTech bubble, and the concept is similar. You're effectively testing your product in a controlled environment with regulatory oversight and supervision before it's deployed to the market. Now this is to, uh, this is to help SMEs and startups in particular, as well as uh, medium-sized businesses to ensure their products go through the regulatory checks initially and before they're released out into the wild or on, onto the market. Why they're necessary is it for a plethora of reasons. One, it gives them immediate user feed, feedback and also regulatory consideration. So you're, yes, there are initial few hoops to jump through, but it, it will save you in the long term. But two, it means you can also work with uh, mark, market access providers and capital providers to alleviate any concerns they have. So it can, it can ease the journey of, or the go-to-market of a product or service or both indeed um, and helps SMEs in particular provide their products. I believe the first sandbox has actually been is in the process of being set up in Spain um, and we expect this to roll out across various other EU member states. I believe they have um, at least a year following the entry into force and delighted to announce to Access Partnership that one one of our key contacts at Deloitte reported that the EU Act is due to be published in the official journal this Friday, which means it enters into force on the 1st of oh. August 2024. So a year from nice. then, uh, yeah, that'll be one of the many um, deadlines or requirements there are. So it's the timing of this is extra extraordinary. Um, now let's talk a little bit more, you know, let's let maybe shift the focus a little bit more to the APEC region and, you know, maybe what the APEC region can can take from the, you know, what's going on in the EU. So, of course, you know, as, as, as you know, as we have discussed before, you know, it's difficult to generalize about APEC given its size and diversity. Um, but if I may put forward an opinion, it feels like many of the APEC countries like Japan, South Korea or Singapore, they seem to maybe be a little bit more concerned about stifling innovation by maybe put it, regulating prematurely. Uh, they have been definitely watching the development of the EU AI closely, but uh, they might seem, they do seem to have a little bit more of a risk appetite for AI right now. So if, if you could, do you have any comments on that? Or is there anything that you might want to say to APEC policymakers who feel that it might be a bit too early for regulation? Um, we, we've worked with various different um you know, policy making bodies both in the EU and outside the EU and what we would just advise is to make sure that the development regulation is commensurate with the with the growth that indeed or at least keeps up is in sync with the technological development. So if if APAC are taking a position that's fine just as long as it doesn't result in um, any significant harm to individuals' interest. That being said, if any APAC businesses were have a connection nexus footprint or presence in the eu they would need to take into account the eu ai act so 
Um, I think we know that the, the Philippines was fairly pro pro proactive last year with their national AI strategy. I believe China is quite for forward thinking on this. Singapore, obviously, with their uh, feet principles, so fairness, explainability, accountability, and transparency. Um, so all these things are um, look at, looking positive, uh, and we would advise is to make sure things are harmonized. Um, again, I think the OECD had um, a, me a meeting or convening of officials last year at the Hiro around um, the Hiroshima principles. Um, and obviously we had the uh, the summit in, in the fall of last year, which was attended by global world leaders. So a lot of things to take into account, but um, I guess policy policy can actually support innovation. Nice. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's really interesting. Um, so, yeah, you know, talking about some of, you know, the APEC priorities when it comes to uh, regulating AI, uh, I think many of many of the policymakers seem to talk a lot about the need to develop, you know, AI model testing and evaluation frameworks, as well as maybe AI standards. And of course, there's a lot of different work streams related to this going on in different international organizations. Um, would, you be able to, would you be able to share your view on how some of these standard development efforts tie into uh, the EU AI Act and what the EU is doing? Well, they're critical. Um, the part of the, so any, for example, for any high risk system under the EU Act would have to undertake conformity assessments and ease of performance against harmoni harmonized standards. Uh, these standards have to be agreed by European standardization organizations such as SEN, SEN, SEN ELEC, ISO. Um, I actually sit on the National AI Committee with the British Standards Institute, which is helping to build and convene those standards, including ISO 40 2001, which is AI, the AI risk management standard. Uh, the, these are these are very important, and I believe, um, but the European Commission has to issue a standardisation request for these bodies to then, who then go off and do them. And I could tell you, without going into specifics, there are several work work streams. Um, to put all these standards together, at least ten, I believe, according to web, if memory serves me correct, from a webinar earlier this year. So, it is um, standards are seen as very much key to help with the implementation of the uh, of the EUAI Act. Nice. Wow. I wish we had time to go into those ten different work streams, but that would make for way too long of a podcast. Uh, yeah. Um, but you know, you talked a lot about some of the interesting trends happening around the world, including the G7 Hiroshima process as well. Um, so I'm just curious to, you know, maybe let's take a step back and ask a more uh, general macro level question. But how do you see global AI governance developing in the future, given that there are so many countries and jurisdictions keen to, you know, provide thought leadership in, in, in this area? What do you think we'll see in, in two years or five years or, or even 10 years? Interesting time spans. Um, well, first and foremost, I think it needs multi-stakeholder collaboration. I'd like to draw attention to the amazing work that Access Partnership did with helping contribute to one of our white papers coming out uh, later today. So I think multi-stakeholder collaboration with uh, leading organizations such as Access Partnership is absolutely critical. Where I see it, it, it may it may differ and everyone's going to have a different take on it, which is fine as long as there is some harmonization across fundamental principles um, and unite, uniting both um, professionals across the private public sectors um, especially um, those in the, sci the science professions and, uh, and academia I think for something as complex and technical as, uh, as AI we definitely need imp input from the experts um, and people who know how these assets actually work uh, under the under the bonnet so I think it, that in terms of time frames it's difficult to say because this evolves at such a rapid pace but I think we're going to see a lot of maybe divergence, then consolidation, and different ideas brought brought to fore. But ultimately, difference in opinions is good because then it can help build our understanding over time. That's I see, I see. That's really that's really interesting. Well, thank you, Michael, for this informative and insightful session. I think you really gave us quite some food for for thought. Um, maybe if there's one thing that you know you hope viewers can will take away from this session, what would that be? K Y A I. Know your AI system. Before you deal with an AI system, whether that's using it, whether that's deploying it, whether that's building it, or any part of the value chain, including importing, distributing, or providing the toolkit, know the risk level, because there is a risk of contributing to a system that 
could be high, which would entail significant compliance costs, or un uh, prohibited, which means it couldn't be deployed in the market. So, like you do for KYC in financial crime, KYAI. Nice. That's a really good one, KYAI. I think I'll use that. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think you know, experts around the world has, have all commented on the importance of transparency and accountability as the foremost priority. So yeah, KYAI, that's really good. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, and that's all we have for today. Thank you for watching.